video, I'm going to go over some tips for debugging your Docker containers uh, and all of the Docker containers that are running in the project since there are multiple Docker containers. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is just go over the file that's actually determining which Docker containers to run and how to run them. So there's two files in the main project that uh, are handling this. There's the docker-compose.yaml file which is actually determining the, the, the structure of the, the different containers and how they're running, the networks that it's creating, um, the shared storage that it's creating. <clears throat> and there's also the start dev script, which is playing a small part in this. Uh, so I'll go over that first, since that's, that's quite a bit more simple. Um, so I'll just explain this line by line. So it's changing into the current directory. Um, that's just to allow you to run the start dev script from inside a finder without being drilled down all the way into the uh, the main directory. Uh, Docker compose the project down. So this is this is basically so we're setting this prefix on the project every time that we run it, so that all of the containers are prefixed by RC in this case. Uh, otherwise, Docker will create one for you based on the directory name, and the directory name might be different depending on the, the developer. Um, so down that just makes sure that. Every Docker container listed in the Docker Compose file is currently offline and not running. Uh, so if you control C out of a running the running application, sometimes not all of the containers will actually shut down in time. Sometimes none of the containers will actually shut down in time, and it will just quit immediately. Um, that just takes care of that. Um, the next line, Docker Compose project name prefix again, uh, remove dash F, so that forces removal of any orphan containers that are no longer running but are still existent in the Docker uh, runtime. The next one, uh, so this line actually builds the images. So the reason that we don't just run up immediately uh, is this allows us to do this basically if we want to. <laughs> and so without building them first, we can't actually scale them until all of the containers are running. Um, so this just lets us scale them before all of the containers actually start up and run. That just ensures that all of the containers start up and actually connect to their uh, the other containers that they need to be connected to on startup. So the next line, that just determines the scale. Uh, scale of one is basically the same thing as saying no scale at all but you can certainly change these numbers and down below is an example of what you can change them to. Uh, you will need to yeah, follow the directions and you'll need to update the Docker Compose file as well. I won't get into scaling in the development environment in this video, but that will be covered in a future video and what types of numbers you can expect to use uh, based on your development machine. And then finally, we actually bring all the containers up and run them. Um, so yeah, so it's a pretty simple script. Just cleans things up and then scales if need be, and then runs, runs all of the containers. So Docker Compose .yaml. Uh, there's quite a bit going on in here. Uh, so at the very top of it, uh, we're defining the different networks. You could certainly, I mean, you could name this anything you want, uh, but it's referenced. That name of the network is actually referenced in each of the containers uh, below. You can have more than one network. So if you want to create, and we probably will create at some point uh, a separate network for the database uh, containers or a separate network for load balancers. Uh, but yeah, that's where you will basically define that. And there are other settings. You can check uh, the Docker documentation on Docker Compose to see what the other settings are that you are able to define. Uh, I believe you're able to define the type of network, although there's only a few that are available right now until the next version of Docker, I believe. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think the default is an overlay network, which is the, I think the most common, which is why it's uh, overlay network, or why it's the default. <laughs> Below that, we have storage volumes. Uh, so these are storage volumes that are being defined globally so that we can use the same storage, uh, virtual storage, I guess you could refer to it as, uh, in multiple containers. That'll make more sense once we actually get down looking at the individual containers and how they're using these volumes. But just like the networks, uh, this name can be anything, and then you can define the driver. Uh, 
yeah, you'll have to check the Docker documentation to see what the available options are for those drivers. And they may even be machine or OS specific, uh, since I think that some of those drivers are actually referencing the file system that you run in or that the uh, storage runs in. Below that, we have services. So these, all the services are all of the containers that are going to be running. Um, yeah, so, well, not, I should say, I shouldn't say the containers that are going to be running, because if you scale this, then there will be two Nginxes, and it's going to automatically suffix that with the, uh, the number of the container at the end. So these are not necessarily container names, but they're really service names. Um, so we have, the format is the service name, and then all of the settings defining it describing that service. Um, so in this case, Nginx is running off of an image, so it's gonna pull an image uh, from this our private registry here, rc.gethost.io, uh, followed by the organization name, followed by the project name, followed by the, followed by the tag. Uh, latest is kind of a special tag with Docker registries in that it's always the latest version, no matter what the version number might be, it's the latest version of, uh, it'll pull the latest version of the Docker image. You might see something like uh, test 175 or 1587, we'll say. Uh, in which case, that's an image that's tagged with the uh, going to the test server or the test uh, uh, infrastructure and the build number. So that build number, sorry, that build number matches up with um, the commit number in GitLab. Uh, below that, you'll see commented out the build line. You can't have an image and a build uh, command at the same time, so it's either one or the other. The image is going to pull that from our local or our private repository registry. Uh, build is going to build it locally, so it's required to reference the directory that the nginx project lives in. You don't need to have these pulled down. That's why we're defaulting to image, uh, pulling the image down. But if you are working on the Nginx uh, side of the service, then you'll probably want to build it so you can actually see your changes as you make them. Um, so with that, what this command is going to do is going to build everything inside of one directory down from here, which would be inside of the main rental for uh, directory here that I have, and then the Nginx directory, which is right here. Um, I'll get more into how you actually build these and how it's being built in future videos. Uh, but yeah, that's how you would reference it from the main project. Compose file. Um, so it depends on. So this doesn't necessarily indicate that HA proxy must be up and running for Nginx to run. Uh, it just indicates that HA proxy has to start running before Nginx runs. So HA proxy could certainly fail and nginx would still kick in it just uh, basically sets the order that the containers will actually run in or start in i should say uh, like i mentioned earlier we're going to reference the network that this container is going to run in or the service is going to run in um, right now for the development environment they're all running in the main network so everything is going you're going to see networks main well, you can define multiple networks here. So you could have a service running on multiple networks. You could have a service running all by itself on a single network that no other services are running on. But right now we have everything running on the same network. Um, and these, these are virtual networks. So this is not your local area network. This is gonna be a virtual network with a subnet. The default subnet is 172 um, something something. Uh, but yeah, everything will start with 172. Uh, ports, so this just defines which ports are going to be open to the container and which ports are going to be mapped back to the local machine. So the first, first number is the port on the local machine. The second number is the port inside of the container. So this is basically saying I'm going to open up port 80 inside of the container and then I'm going to map that to port 80 on the local machine. If you didn't map this to port 80, let's say we map this port 81 on the local machine. On our local machine, when we went to hit the project, Instead of going localhost uh, port 80, we would go localhost port 81. And that's basically going to map back to port 80 on the actual container. Um, this isn't required. You could leave this as port 80, and in which case it's going to assign a dynamic port, and you'll have to check the logs to see what port it gets assigned uh, to access it from your local machine. 
But if you have, um, actually, I'm, I'm not going to get to that yet. I'll get to that when we get down to the HA proxy service. Uh, so yeah, so you can define as many ports as you want being open to that. Just make sure that when these are being mapped, port 80 needs to be available on the local machine. So if you're running something like Apache on your local machine, that service needs to be stopped before you're able to actually run the project. Otherwise, you'll get errors that will indicate that the port is unavailable. Um, so below ports, we're mapping volumes. So, we're, so this is a good example of mapping uh, two sets of volumes. We'll get down below to see how we can map the other ways. Uh, this is mapping those virtual volumes that we created up here. So this is mapping JS stock data, which is a virtual volume, uh, to a an actual volume on the container. So just like ports. This is basically saying where is that volume coming from and where is it getting mapped to. Um, same thing with coverage data, just a different volume that's being mapped internally to a uh, directory inside of the Nginx container. Um, below volumes, we have environment variables. So these are just yeah, environment variables that are being set inside of the container when it runs, uh, which is very good for configuration type things. So below Nginx, we have the HA proxy service. Uh, I'm not going to go over every, every one of the services, but the HA proxy service in particular is one that's a good example of mapping uh, volumes in a different way. So what this is doing is instead of mapping a virtual volume like we did with Nginx, this is mapping a volume on our local machine. Uh, so this is getting the docker.soc file from our local uh, machine, from my Mac in this case and it's mapping it to a file inside of the actual container. And the reason that HAProxy is mapping this file in particular is HAProxy will automatically reconfigure itself based on the startup and shutdown of other containers that it's load balancing. And docker.soc is, is, uh, is the, the file that actually determines which containers are running and not running. Uh, yeah. So it's actually the socket to Docker. And then environment variables again. Uh, yeah, nothing special there. They're just environment variables. Um, let me see really quick if we have any other special cases with any other uh, containers. So with the API um, container, you'll notice that we're mapping this. Do that. Uh, we're mapping the same virtual volume as we were in. Nginx, that means that this data is going to be shared between the two. So this is saying we're going to map this virtual volume to the JS slash JS doc volume inside of the container. So anything that gets written to this slash JS doc container or um, volume, that directory, sorry, is also going to end up in this directory in Nginx. Um, so those are actually linked because this volume actually exists outside of those two containers, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so anything that gets written in here, and what, the way we're using this is API, the API service is actually generating these JS doc files on the fly every time that uh, the application restarts. And then it's pushing them over to Nginx to be served, since they're just static HTML files, or semi-static in this case, HTML files. Uh, we can just use Nginx to serve those instead of using uh, Node.js to serve them. Same thing with coverage data. Um, I think those are all of the, yeah, that, that should cover everything. Um, so you noticed in that start dev script, there was a comment saying that you need to go back to Docker Compose to change the file if you scale things. Uh, down below here is where you'll, you'll see some instruction on those areas that you need to uh, change or uncomment to enable scaling. But I will cover that in a future video. So let me get into some debugging steps. Um, so I'm just going to uh, start the project. So the application is starting up. I've run this before, so it shouldn't have to pull down any images. And, oh, <laughs> forgot to remove our uh, yeah, tag test does not exist. Of course, because I just made it up. All right, so let's run that again. 
So it shouldn't take too long because it doesn't need to pull down those images. And port 443 is already being allocated. All right, so this is, we're already getting into uh, some, some useful uh, debugging. So first I'm gonna see if I have any other Docker containers running. And I do. So the first thing we're gonna do is actually stop all those Docker containers. Uh, so we are going to stop. I have a whole nother project. Ah, I know why. Uh, sorry, I'm running another project as well. Oops. So let me stop that really quick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're running like the Interstate Aerials project and the Rental 4 project, they're both using the same ports. Uh, so you can't do that. Okay. So now I should be good. Start def. Now it should start up. Um, if those ports were in use and they're not in use by some other Docker project that's running, um, check the documentation for your particular operating system. You can you should be able to see uh, exactly which services are actually using those ports. I think it's in Mac, it's, it's some kind of a net stat command. Uh, but hey, I don't remember the options off the top of my head. All right, so it is up. Um, in our application right now anyway, it retries connecting to the Couchbase server until it gets a connection every three seconds. Uh, Couchbase takes quite a while to actually boot up and initialize all the buckets and then uh, actually balance them across the different uh, containers. In this case, there's only one, so it doesn't have to do that step. But if you're scaling up, it does take quite a while for Couchbase to balance across the multiple containers. Um, all right, so let's first first command. These are all going to be terminal commands uh, that I'm going to show is Docker ps, and I actually just used it a little while ago. So what this command does is so let me just make this the screen. And get rid of our code in the background so it's a little bit clearer. Um, so what this command does is shows you a list of all of the running containers. Uh, gives you the container ID, which isn't super useful. Uh, it tells you what image is running, which is nice. So if you're not sure of what tag uh, version you run or what, what image tag you're actually running in development, uh, you can see that there. The command that was run with it, um, so unless you're actually working on building the Docker uh, images yourself, you're probably not too concerned with that. That's just the command that the container runs on startup. Like you see, yeah, npm start. That should, that should, that one should make sense. Uh, some of the others might not because we don't actually, we're not actually building those images. They're built by the vendor. Uh, when it was created, yeah, how long it's been up. So the ports, so if you didn't specify that you wanted port 80 to map to port 80 on the container, um, and you just left it as port 80, where it was a dynamic assignment uh, from the local host, this is where you would go to see what that dynamic assignment might be. Uh, yeah, so this will list all of the ports that are open to it. And then names. Names is important because all of the other container or all of the other commands, a lot of them I'm going to show you, you're going to need to reference that name to get more information about that specific container. So let's actually uh, let's look at another way that you can run this this ps command and that's docker compose.ps. And you actually have to be in the directory that the docker compose file is in. Uh, so if you run docker compose ps inside of the directory that docker compose is running in, and you won't see anything. All right. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure why it's not working, but what it basically shows is this without the container ID, uh, without the created and status, but it will tell you the state of it. So if it's starting up or if it's shutting down, if it's running. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure why that's not working. It should be. Uh, but I will find out and I will update the documentation with that. <laughs> I'll at least show the view of what it's supposed to look like. Um, Alright, so let's say that we have a problem container 
Uh, we're not sure of what IP address it's getting inside of the virtual Docker network. You can do a command it's called docker inspect, and this is basically going to inspect a single container and then give you a whole bunch of information about it. Uh, so yeah, so you'll see quite a bit comes out. Uh, the useful information that I've needed in the past was pretty much all at the bottom. Um, all the environment variables that are being set. So, uh, the, where is the networking? So here's all the networking settings. So this will tell you uh, the IP addresses, the host name that is actually being defined, the different ports that are accessible to the container, all that kind of information. It's not too often that I'll need to use this command uh, to debug anything, but it's, it provides a lot of useful information that you could use. Um, so the next command, docker logs. So this is the one that we use the most. If um, so, when you when you run the application, you get this console output for every container, but it's all mixed together. So it's very hard to see just the logs for API 1, API 1 container in this case. Uh, so if I had an issue with the API container, I could run docker logs and then reference that container name. And it'll show me all of that console output just for that container, that specific container. Which, yeah, it's not too bad. And you'll notice that it's no longer prefixed by that container name. So there's no, no real colorfulness to this. But yeah, so that's how you can get just the logs for a single container. Um, okay, so the next command is actually the most useful. This will let you open up a shell terminal inside of the container. So this isn't going to be the same for every container. And I'll show you what's, what might be different uh, depending on the container. So we're going to stick with API 1. And so the command is docker exec uh, dash it means interactive and terminal. Uh, the container name, rcapi1. And then the command that you actually want to run on that container. So you can execute. Um, any command that you could normally execute from a terminal on that container by typing in whatever you want here. So you could echo test and a little echo test on the actual uh, uh, what you call it? on the actual container itself. Uh, so more useful is you can actually run the bash, and now we're inside of the actual API container. Um, oh yeah. no? oh, I guess it's not installed by default on the uh, on that container. Um, so I mentioned that sometimes you'll have uh, something that, a different command that you would need to run based on the container. The only difference is that some containers uh, don't have bash, in which case you just need to run the regular shell, and some have both. Like. Yeah, it has both. So this is really useful to see where files are going um, and to see how files are being generated. If they're being generated, you can check out configuration files. In the case of something like Nginx, uh, I believe Nginx configuration files are being created at startup time based on environment variables. So you could run this to get a bash shell inside of the Nginx container and then see what that configuration file looks like that's actually being generated. Useful to see if it's being generated properly or if you're running into some issue where it's not generating it properly based on whatever uh, shell script is generating it. Um, so you can also run things inside of this. So in this case, we're in the API, we could run a npm test and it'll actually run the tests inside of that container just as if we were sitting at the actual machine in a virtual machine uh, case. Uh, so yeah, so we just ran this inside of the container. And you can run whatever you want. So I'm going to exit that. Uh, so I have 
two more examples. It's really one just broken up into two steps. So you can push, you can push Docker images directly to the private registry. It's not recommended, but in the case of debugging things on in the testing environment, it might be useful. Um, so to do that, first you need to make sure that you're actually logged into that um, our private registry, and you should be. You wouldn't have been able to run the application the first time if you weren't. Uh, let me actually just stop all of this. You can run the stop dev script, or you can just control C out of it. The start dev script is going to clean up anything that was left behind anyway. Um, so, assuming that you're already logged into the private registry, you can build uh, your Docker images by using this command, docker build, tag t, so that just says that we're going to indicate our tag. It's not going to use the latest tag by default. Uh, and it's going to be rc.git post, which is the domain for the private registry, uh, the organization, rental core, and then the project name will we'll just use the API one. And we'll say we'll tag it with video tests so this doesn't automatically get deployed anywhere. Uh, and then followed up by the directory. So in this case, it is. Let me make sure. Uh, we, are, we are in the main. So it should be at. So inside of app, you'll see our Docker file for the application. So from here, it's just app. And then you'll see it actually start to build it. This should look familiar because this is pretty much what it's going to do the first time that you run the application. It's going to pull down all of the packages from NPM. Oh, this will take a little while. So you can you can tag things with whatever you want. If you're debugging, I would recommend tagging it with your first initial first letter of your first name and then your last name, underscore or some something meaningful like test or a number that references a commit or something like that. Uh, but make some kind of a personal reference so that other developers know that that's an image being used for some debugging purposes by you. It shouldn't be too often that we need to push manually to um, testing since this will circumvent all unit tests being run and integration tests being run by the CI slash CD setup. All right, it's almost finished. And the, the other way you could do this is just actually commit and uh, the CI slash D CD will automatically build the image for you as long as it meets the requirements. But there will be some rare cases where we need to push manually uh, to get images into testing. Yeah, it should be finishing now. Okay, so it's done now, so it's successfully built it. So now we just need to push it up to uh, the private registry. So do that, docker for push, uh, reference that image, get those.io, the organization, and then what do we call it? We call it. Ah, oh, man. So we wrote this down. What was the tag? Uh, let's just see what the tag is. So you might run into this problem as well. If we run a command called Docker Images, it should give us a list of all the images. Um, so we called it, so this is what our tag was, video underscore test. So this is going to be a list of all the images that are currently downloaded uh, using Docker. Docker push rc.getpost.io or the organization and PI video test. And that's all you need. You'll see it start to push all of those things. Oh, and I'm not off it. Get this that I All right, well, let's log back in. Then. Uh, so if you're doing this as well for the first time, then docker login rc.getpost.io. 
your username, that's your GitLab username, and then your password is, uh, you'll have to watch my previous video to see where you actually generate that. Uh, find that. So let's push that again. Huh. Oh, I know why. Uh, this actually needs to match. So the name actually needs to match the repository name, uh, which there is no API repository, it's main. So we actually need to rebuild that. And there we go. So it went a lot faster this time because that image was already cached. It's the exact same image, just a different tag. Uh, so. Do that again, and now it'll push it. There we go. So yeah, when you're building things, the uh, the image name actually needs to match the repository name because the private the private registry that we're using is connected to the actual repository. So that when you're looking at commits and pipeline and all of that, you can also see the private repository images associated with that project. Oh, so this should go pretty, um, not connected to a VPN, so this should go pretty fast. And once this is pushed, it will be accessible by the testing environment. You could pull it down even. Uh, so actually I'll show you what you would do while that's running. And so, that closed up. so if you wanted to run that particular image in your local environment, you could do it one of two ways. You could. So you could either build it, so you'd build from your local directory, or if you wanted to, you could reference that image right here. Right, that tag right here, which was video test. And we'll actually we'll run that once this once this actually gets finished pushing. Since this, this, it shouldn't have to re-download this because we we actually built this on our local machine, so it should be in the cache images. And let's make sure that, that is the case once this finishes. And upload speed not so fast today. And there we go. All right, so it is done pushing that image up to the registry. Uh, so let's start. Okay. Uh, we didn't actually make any changes, so it's going to be hard to prove to you that it is actually running this image and not previous image. But it is. I don't actually know if the logs show you what the image name is that it's pulling, since this wasn't actually pulled. It's already on our local machine. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, that is how you would run that image, that particular image on your local machine. I'm going to remove all that. Uh, so yeah, so those are some debugging tips that I have uh, with Docker. And as we get into some more, maybe we'll create another video with additional tips.